Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Clements, the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS, Extension Sarasota County. I am bringing to you today an episode of the LIFE program, Learning in Florida's Environment. And joining us as our guest speaker is Dr. Abby Turna. She's going to talk to you about microplastics and matter. So you may have heard about microplastics, but even if you haven't, I know you know how bad litter and pollution is for our environment. Microplastics is a type of plastic pollution that's just so small that often you can't see it unless you have a magnifying glass or a microscope. So how small are microplastics? Well, they are considered pieces of plastic that are five millimeters or smaller. Well, what's that mean? What's five millimeters? Well, you can get out a ruler and check at home or, oh look, I have my trusty pencil here. And a pencil eraser is about five millimeters in size. So pieces of plastic that are the size of your pencil eraser or smaller, those are called microplastics. Plastics can be made small on purpose or larger pieces of plastics can break down over time into smaller and smaller pieces. These plastics come from all sorts of sources like plastic bags and our plastic water bottles, toys and bean bags, even things like our face scrub and our clothing that's made from polyester. And this plastic pollution can be found in our fresh water and in our ocean water. And the animals that live in these waters can eat them by drinking the water or some of those larger plastics actually look like food to animals like sea turtles and dolphins. So this is really bad for both the animals and our environment. And plastic may get smaller and smaller over time, but it never really goes away. And this is why matter matters. Let's go find Dr. Abby and learn more. Hi, I'm Dr. Abby Turna, and I'm the Water Resources Extension Agent here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. Today I'm going to talk to you about microplastics. So let's get right into it. I want to introduce you to Captain Moore. So Captain Moore discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And if you have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, then you might be thinking, that is a huge island of trash in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I think that's because people want you to believe that. But really, if we actually ask scientists, what is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? What we'll find out is that it's actually a soup that looks like this, a plastic pollution in the middle of the ocean. So that means if you are flying over the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, or even on a boat riding through it, as Captain Moore is here, you actually don't see any trash in the water. It's not until you actually reach in there and you grab a sample that you'd find all that plastic pollution floating in the water. And it's able to float from the top all the way to the bottom of the ocean at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And so let me tell you how that actually forms. It forms by big world currents, so large ocean currents moving the water, right? So you got two currents that converge, making a whirlpool motion trapping the trash and that's how you get the great pacific garbage patch we actually have five of these garbage patches just the great pacific one is the most notable but each of the places where these large ocean currents come together make that whirlpool motion called a gyre or a gyre and that is where these trash traps are located so why we are able to use our power of observation to split up the types of microplastic we saw in captain moore's jar Let's actually turn to physics to figure out why plastic is able to be at all levels of the ocean, from the bottom to the middle to the top. And if we turn to physics, the first thing we're going to find is some fundamental truths or like the foundation of physics, which is that all things are made up of matter. Okay, so I know you've learned about matter. So all things are made up of matter. So take a look around. What do you see that's made up of matter? Here we can see picnic tables and benches. That's made up of matter, right? But how do you know that? Because there's two questions you can ask yourself when you're looking at things to see if it's made up of matter. The first question is, does it take up space? Well, certainly our picnic table and benches take up space, right? So that must be matter. 
Well, I said there's two questions. So what's the second question? That it contains mass or weight. So it's actually mass, but we're gonna actually substitute the word mass for weight right now. So the picnic table, oh, I can't even lift it. So it's super heavy and it takes up space, therefore it must be matter. Well, what about this rock? Is this rock matter? Of course, right? It takes up space and it's not as heavy as the picnic table, but it certainly has some weight. And then what about this leaf? This leaf definitely takes up space and it also is much lighter than the rock, but has some weight associated with it. So they're both matter. So microplastics then are matter, right? Because they take up space and they do have weight. Although they are very, very light, they do have an associated weight. So what happens to matter when it goes in water? So there are a couple things that can happen when matter goes into water. Um, it could sink, right? We saw some of the microplastics at the bottom of Captain Moore's jar. It could float. We saw some of those microplastics in the middle of the jar um, or at the top or it could be dissolved. Oh my goodness, another word. What does dissolved mean? So dissolved is just when something um, forms a solution. So that means um, that it becomes incorporated into a liquid. So I've got a liquid here, it's water. And if I put a piece of this plant in, do you think it's going to sink, float, or dissolve? Do you think it's gonna become incorporated into the liquid, like my favorite beverage, coffee, where you can't even distinguish the coffee from the water anymore, right? Except for it's just a colored water now. So what's your hypothesis? I think it's going to float. Let's check it out. All right, so predictably the leaf is floating. Okay, so the leaf is floating. It's, a, it's matter that floats. What about if I take a piece of this rock and I put it in the water? What is this matter gonna do? Is it going to sink, float, or dissolve? Well, I don't think it's gonna dissolve because it's pretty robust. And I think it's heavier than the leaf, so I think it's going to sink. Let's see. Sure enough, it predictably sinks. So some matter sinks, some matter floats, and some matter can actually be dissolved. All right, so we saw that the leaf floated, but what about this leaf enabled it to float? Sure, it's light, right? So it's much lighter than the rock that sank. But what else about it? Well, can you see how flat it is? And most of its weight is distributed over a very large surface area compared to the rock where most of its weight is really in the middle, right? It's not distributed across such a wide surface area. So the rock is gonna sink, but the leaf is gonna float. All right, so the question is, why can microplastics be at the top of the ocean, the middle of the ocean, and the bottom of the ocean? And I think we're coming to understand a couple things, right? We're understanding that all things are made up of matter. Matter um, has two fundamental characteristics. It is able to take up space and it has weight. And depending on how that weight is distributed across the matter, it has the ability to sink or float. So now we already seeing what can happen with tiny plastics known as microplastics. And so that plastic actually comes from a wide variety of sources. It comes from bigger plastic breaking up into smaller pieces, but then sometimes plastics just made small on purpose. So can you think of ways that plastic is made small on purpose? I have one, I brought it to show and tell. This is my friend, the frog. Do you ever have a stuffed animal that when you hit it, it makes like a noise or you feel like little beans in there. Those are tiny plastics known as microplastics that were made small on purpose to give this frog the ability to sit. So let's take a look at the different types of plastic and let's decide whether or not they're gonna sink or float. So here what I've done is I set up a bunch of different types of plastic and I put them, I arrange them rather in weight categories. So we are going from lightest over here next to the jar to heaviest. And then this last one came from my friend, the frog. And so really it's an unknown. I was not able to weigh this one. And so what you could see is that they all though have very similar characteristics as far as the way they take up um, space, right? So they all have the same shape rather. And so then 
whether or not they sink or float is not gonna be dependent on their shape because they all have the same shape, but it's gonna be dependent on then how much weight is associated with that shape. I hope that makes sense. So these are the lightest things. And so if they're the lightest things, and uh, what do you think is going to happen when we throw them in the water? So this one is actually so light that if I left them on the table, they would have just blown away with any wind. So knowing that then, I think you all have already predicted that they're going to float. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop those in. You can see they're the whiter ones. And now you see that they're floating. There's the third one. And here comes the fourth one. They're floating. All right, awesome. Now let's do the same thing with a different type of plastic. So they're from a different origin than the ones I just threw in. These are very light. So I'm predicting that they're all going to float and there's already some in there. So you can see them all floating with the other ones. And then this kind was actually taken from my face soap. And if you zoom in there, you can see specks of the plastic sticking to the jar. That's the original size of the plastic. So it's super, super tiny. And so whether or not it's going to sink or float is gonna be about how much weight is distributed on each of those tiny particles. So I'll go ahead and throw some of those in there. And they're gonna do all different things you're gonna see. Let me go ahead and shake it up. This is more like the ocean anyway, isn't it? All right, so it's like a gyre. So what you can see is you have some plastics at the bottom, some plastics in the middle, and some plastics still floating at the top. So remember the question is, what happens? How are those plastics able to go from the bottom of the ocean, in the middle, and in the top? And it really has to do with matter, right? And how much weight is distributed among the space that matter takes up, and how that changes over time depending on how the plastic breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces or how the plastic might have been made small on purpose. Like my face soap plastic that you can maybe barely see in there, that's both at the bottom, it's in the middle and it's at the top. That was made tiny in order to help exfoliate your skin or remove some layers of skin to make your skin feel new. So it was made very, very tiny on purpose. The last thing I wanna show you then is some plastic that I know to be heavy which is this one over here. We'll see that it just goes right to the bottom. And then plastic from my friend, the frog. I have no idea what it's gonna do. So what I can do though, is I can use my knowledge of what I just told you. So it takes up the same amount of shape as the other, or the same amount of space as the other ones. But really I don't have a scale in front of me, so I don't know if it's heavier or lighter than the ones that sink and it's so small that it's hard to tell. So we'll just throw it in and see what happens. And it looks like they all sank. So when you're going to solve this huge microplastic problem, because there are so many microplastics in the ocean that scientists say there are 16 truckloads of microplastic entering the ocean every minute. If that is true, we need to solve that huge microplastics problem, right? So when you create a tool or a device or whatever you decide to invent to take that microplastic out of the water, you have gotta remember that it's a soup. You've got the plastic at the bottom, you got the plastic in the middle, and you have the plastic floating at the top. So you have to create a device that can, cre that can take the plastic out of all of the entire water column of the ocean. That's a huge challenge, which is why this microplastic pollution problem has been so hard to solve. But I know you can do it. Use science as your guide. Remember that matter is everywhere. We're all made up of matter and matter matters. So next time you think about your stuffed animal or you um, reach out for that plastic straw, ask yourself, do I need that? Or maybe should I use something else? And the other thing I want you to do is I want you to go around your neighborhood and I want you to collect plastic just like I did and put it into categories. Put it into categories of matter, right? So put it in categories based on size and how much weight is distributed 
across the size. So something like a leaf, like this blue plastic, or something that's more dense, like the plastic that came out of my frog that just sinks right down to the bottom. And then go ahead and get a jar and figure out, predict which ones are gonna sink or float. And if they don't do what you predicted, figure out why. But listen, when you have a jar full of water and all those plastics, don't just throw it out, okay? That's the most important part. Use a coffee filter. Drop it through the coffee filter. Like what I'll do is I'll put a coffee filter on top of this jar, I'll use a rubber band, and then I will pour the water out and all the plastics will stay in the coffee filter and then I can just throw that in the trash. Sound like a plan? Thank you, Dr. Abby, for sharing with us about why matter matters and how we can make choices to decrease the plastics pollution problem. If you want to learn more about plastics pollution, watch our other life science short on how pollution affects our watersheds. And don't forget when you go outside to collect that plastic, be safe. You might want to wear gloves or use something else to pick up the plastics. Then take them home, make your predictions and your observations, just like our scientist, Dr. Abby. Will the plastic sink or will the plastic float? I really look forward to hearing about your famous inventions that you're gonna come up with on how to clean the microplastics out of our oceans. Have a really great time doing these activities and I look forward to seeing you at our next episode of Life. Bye-bye.